Do you remember what we sat by the Yes. It's you a long way it? to Tipperary. Did you see that? We did. And I had no clue. I was completely like, <laughs> just like an Israeli just landed in London. Like, I don't know what everyone's Oh, because it was inspired about. by Charlie Chaplin. There was it something was about Charlie, Charlie Chaplin. Chaplin lived, uh, around the corner from here. Uh, yeah. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to go. That is, that's it. Barrier. Climb in. I can still climb in. Barriers have never kept us out of sites we wanted to get into before. Get across. Yeah. Do you think? Do you know? Did I ever tell you that there uh, is a road down a little bit further down called Dante Road? He did not tell me this. So I think that is what where it comes from. You think? It would make sense. It's like I imagine whoever graffitied Dante or die is like you live on Dante or dies Dante Road or nothing. Got Bart Simpson now in a dragon and a Smurf smoking a spliff. Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's what we'd be doing our improvisations about. <laughs> it today. would still be a good <laughs> start of a show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Daphna, where are we? We're in Kennington Park, Terry. <laughs> Standing on top of a skate park. Yep. Yeah, as uh, there's lots of graffiti. We've climbed over the railings and we're back in. <laughs> this is where it all started. Hello everyone who's listening, I'm Terry. This is our podcast. I'm one of the co-artistic directors of Dante Odai. And I'm Daphna. I'm the other co-artistic director of Dante Odai Theatre. Dante Odai is a theatre company. We make shows in unusual spaces. Yeah, like in hotel rooms or leisure centres or self-storage buildings or cafes. And we wanted to come here because many moons ago we started devising in this skate park because there was a graffiti that said Dante or Die on it. And we used that as an improvisation to start making a show. And we didn't know that name will stick with us, didn't we? Because a a month or two later before we even graduated, we didn't know anything and I found myself sitting in a meeting at the Thames Festival and they asked me, okay, great, so we need to go to print, so what's the company's name? And I went, uh, we just remembered the graffiti. We didn't realise that we'll have to keep that name for two decades after <laughs> and, and explain why we're called Dante or Die. <laughs> but yeah, we use the graffiti here and the park as an inspiration for making a, quite a random performance, I would say. Yeah, like what do you remember from that performance? Uh, I remember there was a, a, we put a piano in the middle of the park Mm -hmm. and then I was wearing a big bright pink ball gown and Anthea was hiding underneath my ball gown so as I walked towards the piano she jumped out from (laughs) underneath my ball gown. I don't remember why. Uh, Obviously Dante was maybe her inspiration. And then Stephen Swift fell from a tree and ran towards us and then we all ran over here to the skate park put skate uh, roller blades on and started skating around and singing it's a long way to Tipperary I mean Oscar winning performances really it was it really was <laughs> yeah <laughs> so since this skate park is where it all started where we started thinking about making theatre in unusual spaces we figured it makes sense to come back here on the first day of recording this podcast where we kind of reflect back and think about things we've learned and experiences we had since we started doing this together. Yep, and we've invited loads of brilliant artists and different people we've worked with over the last few years to come into the studio and chat with us about uh, how we've made the shows with them. It'll be fun. hope so. <laughs> We made it. 
from the skate park to lovely recording studio. Here we are, and it's our first episode, and I guess it made sense to look back a little bit and set the scene for this. Yeah, and we wanted to bring to this podcast the mistakes and the challenging and the sticky points, and not just the successful moments and the <laughs> joyful moments. So we wanted to find someone to chat with us, um, someone who challenged us a little bit. Yeah, somebody with a critical mind. Someone who's been on some of our theatrical journeys over the years. What a build up. <laughs> Let's say hello to Nancy Gross. Hello. Very nice to be here. I'm really excited. Thank you. Thanks Thank for being here. Thank you for coming to chat with us. So uh, how was your day so far? Well, my day is always uh, usually the world of digital journalism in the newsroom. Um, so, uh, you know, that's looking at what's happening in Westminster and the world and interpreting it for our readers' lives. Um, it's, it's hectic. <laughs> and Does anybody know what's going on in Westminster right now? <laughs> I don't think so right now. A lot of twists and uh, U-turns. But I think that, uh, yeah, basically it makes uh, jumping out of that and into your world a real pleasure today. We've known you for a while, Nancy. Yeah, I think it was in Reading, outside the lock and store, uh, the self-storage unit, um, to watch Handle with Care. I was writing a feature about the show for The Guardian, saw the show, and then I also got the train home with you afterwards, and I remember talking all the way home. So it's super nice to be chatting to you here again while we make this podcast. Um, and I know you've been talking to lots of your collaborators and other creatives during this process. So I guess, has it made you reflect on the work that you've done up to this point? Yeah, it definitely has. Um, I think the key things for me are like the sense of like community that comes with what we do and like how we involve local people within a lot of the work we're doing whether that's research or taking part Mm -hmm. what about you Daphne? Intimacy Mm. being really up close to an audience and what stories that brings was a big I I guess it's also shown us and I guess we know it but we are always trying new things like I think we don't do the same kind of thing over and over and that's Oh, I think what keeps us alive and excited to keep making work together. And of course, occupying spaces, different spaces, mm. um, touring to different real spaces, meeting real people in those places has come up a lot. I mean, that's definitely what makes it exciting to be in an audience member in your show um, or any of your shows. Uh, I love sitting in an auditorium in a red velvet chair, but uh, I also like being in a space and hearing a story. And I think that what I love about Dante or Die is that you have both. You you can't have the space without the story and sometimes experiences that are just immersive without the story don't work and yours feel very deep and meaningful because of having both. Well that's one of the things we actually chat about um, in episode two with the writers as well like how we brought story into that because our early work was quite experiential and we felt like that was missing and we wanted to have a heart to the the buildings we were occupying and, and that's been a key feature of our work like What's the emotional resonance of this space? What's the real life stories, the real emotions that we're experiencing while we're sitting in a leisure centre changing room or in a storage unit? Um, Because actually we're all living through these spaces. And how can we tailor the story through the space as you're moving an audience in those very, you know, narrow corridors and in these changing rooms and hotel rooms? How can you tailor the story to the space specifically? I've got such vivid memories of Handle with Care in that lock and store. Uh, And I think I I sort of ended up writing into the the feature that it was obviously a a metaphor for our emotions and our our memories. But actually, it was also just a really amazing experience, uh, you know, a really physical experience as we followed you through. What do you remember about physically being an audience member in this I remember that dance bit when the music came on and everyone was dancing to the the daughter's (laughs) iPhone. Was it Taylor Swift? It was Taylor Swift. Like a lot of Handle with Care had like quite realism in it. Um, and Chloe Moss's dialogue was very realistic. But then we were able to throw th- things like real life size bunnies walking through the corridor and suddenly you, you kind of upend this quite boring, bland space with this other 
uh, the re- you reframe it, don't you? Yeah. And that's one of the things we love doing. I think the show that sticks in my mind more than any other, though, is Skin Hunger. And that has a lot to do with the fact it was the first show I saw coming out of that long pandemic pause. Um, and it was a show I definitely needed. I don't know, I think probably a lot of your audience needed. Because I was a state, I was, I was in a state of real longing for a cultural experience at that point, uh, or maybe deprivation. I think longing and deprivation are kind of the same thing. <laughs> um, and, and for culture, yeah, but also for contact. And of course, that show absolutely delivered that almost painfully. You talked about intimacy. It was almost painfully intimate in its setting, in its sound, in its writing. And it's a bit like when you cry in yoga class, I came out sort of flawed, <laughs> really. <laughs> if you wanted to hold me, Hold me and tell me it's okay. It's okay, man. Okay. <sighs> Is this all right? Hmm. How do you do that? How does that work? I just remember walking into the space uh, with that incredible design. Is it by Khadija? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the sound uh, and the and the um, movement around that space. Must have been such a complicated show to put together, though, especially in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, it was. And it was a different challenge to other shows we've done because we had the whole COVID to deal with. Our producer at the time, Sophie, was like up to date with all the tiers, rules, all those things that existed for a while. What kind of plastic we could, couldn't use. What, can... what cleaning products. But we tried to put it into the show. Mm. So I don't know if you remember, but the plastic was cleaned as part of the. We choreographed the cleaning of the plastic into the transitions that became. All of the limitations became part of the choreography of the show. I was going to say the challenges became virtues. Yeah, which I think happens a lot through our work, doesn't it? Um, because it's really important to be challenged and have all these things making you make these definite decisions that wouldn't happen otherwise. So what have been some of the other challenges or sticking points you've encountered when making your shows? Lots and lots. <laughs> and the, the problem is you can never know what the challenges would be, mm. as is with life. But <laughs> in site-specific theatre, you're just working in real working places. So... For example, uh, when we worked in leisure centres, we had a scene where we had um, a, a male singer and a female uh, singing in a female changing room, and a female singer singer in a singing in a male changing room. But we could never rehearse it, only until ten minutes before a show. We didn't think about that when we wrote it, and we come there, and there's just no way we could rehearse it. I mean, one of our main issues is getting people to say yes to to us doing this, like going to Hilton Hotel saying, please, can we have six of your hotel rooms to do a show in? Um, and we've kind of learned that through the years of, of kind of approaches of how to do this and how to make it useful to our partners and to pitch it as a partnership rather than, please, can we borrow this thing? Or so that you kind of learn this as we go. So it's interesting because Daphne and I are a director and performer often, but we're also producers. So we have an idea and then we have to figure out how to make it happen as well with, with now a brilliant team that we work with. But for years, it was just us kind of going, let's just go into this hotel and ask them if we can do this. A lot of the time, Terry's charm really helps to get us <laughs> stuff. But sometimes we think it will <laughs> we'll just it will be enough, but it's not. I remember after we um, we did I Do and it was a really successful project and there was a lot of press around it and the Hilton gave us six hotel rooms for free just to present the show uh, and, and a few other hotels as well. We thought it would be so easy to get a self-storage building because clearly we just got, you know, all the, these hotel chains and it really wasn't easy. No. I remember we walked into a lot of the big companies' offices with this pack in our hands just saying, can we speak to so-and-so? And nobody spoke with us. They said it's it's in breach of their terms and conditions. We actually then ended up spending some time with the set designer going, okay, let's let's build our own self-storage unit in a converted warehouse or something. And we went down that line, like he designed something. And then we were like, that's no, defeating the right. point. Let's go back. Let's start again. Yeah, it strikes um, me this is your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> it is because I think... St- spaces tell stories and and it's 
and usually those spaces are working spaces. So they're occupied by, you know, gym goers who go to the gym every day. And the last thing they want is their treadmill to be taken by a bunch of theater makers. <laughs> <laughs> and so how do you learn how to mitigate that? We would come in with T-shirts saying, take on me and with flyers and some had somebody there just saying, Here's here's a bit of about what we do. Come and see the show. So it's more friendly. Always um, arriving on the first day with uh, biscuits for the reception team and make sure that they all know what's going on. It's simple things, but they help you kind of get everyone on board, right? And also, it's it's funny because when when you make theatre, or if you've been a young person who's in like a youth theatre or something, you know, you get this like little club mentality, don't you? And that's one of the joys of it. Is like you become this little family. But when you're going into these spaces, you have to kind of remind yourselves that you can't just be in that little bubble and that you have to engage with people all the time and help them understand a bit what you're trying to achieve. It's quite hard to do. But you don't only engage with people, right? Sometimes there's animals also <laughs> that you have to engage with in these spaces. <laughs> Hello, I need to hear more about this. <laughs> so in Handle with Care, you had a fun experience directing <laughs> it was me and fred wasn't it it was we were... you and fred we were rehearsing a show I was sitting there with my notebook and suddenly i see their faces just pausing and they looked at me like i've done something wrong and i didn't realize what was happening and then i realized a mouse was just walking all <laughs> over me jumping back into the space you jumped didn't you or i jumped yes it was not fun he just wanted to be part of the show yeah well, Sometimes it, was, it could be magical, like the cat. At the yeah, roundhouse. yeah. When we did the "Use Not Found" in the Roundhouse Bar Cafe, the Roundhouse's cat arrived, slinked through, and it was at this brilliant moment because it's the moment where I'm talking about a lioness coming into the cafe, opening the door, and then this cat just started walking through. So it was magic, absolute magic, in the grand tradition of theatre cats as well. <laughs> the horrifying thing, of course, is that it seems as though everything's just going to carry on as normal. Margaret sits in the corner and takes an hour and a half to eat a slice of lemon drizzle cake, crumb by crumb. Giancarlo puts his feet up on the chair next to him and reads his second-hand Calvino. Dennis and Barbara exchange small, lonely syllables about their neighbor's daughter's lesbian wedding. It's like they're sharing a bag of unpleasant cough sweets. And I've got my regular peppermint tea, my regular glass of water, and my ginger cookie. Nothing about me seems to have changed. Maybe nothing has. So this one morning I'm working on this thing that I'm writing and out of the corner of my eye I catch this glimpse. It's like a half second glimpse of a lioness coming in through the door of the cafe. <laughs> Unhurried, unmistakable lioness. She's so sleek, so covert. Nobody else notices her. And you know, sometimes corridors, long corridors, buildings, um, a lot of the challenges and, and moments of, of things going wrong were, were around a door getting locked and the performer not knowing the code to it. Mm. The, you remember at the National when we did La Fiela Mod, three of the performers got locked out and didn't make it to the last scene. Or somebody not knowing how to turn the lights on. We have this thing that we do whenever we arrive into a new site. We call it the light, light switch workshop, which is basically everybody in the team, let's get into the, all the rooms, where are the light switches, how do you turn the air conditioning on, how do you open all the doors. It's a really practical thing that you get out of the way in order to be able to make the art. <laughs> so you can plan for everything, but actually a lot of the magic in the shows happens because the site is almost a performer as well and you, yeah. you, you can't plan for the good or bad but uh, it happens, life happens I think that maybe that p point you made about um, it needing to be a real uh, storage unit is important because it has to ring true for the audience there's something deeply true and authentic about your shows and it has to be integrated into that community yeah. Yeah. I think a, lot of, a lot of the times what we love is hearing audience members coming out of a show I, I actually remember it was in pool, I think, an audience member coming out and looking at the swimming pool at the leisure center and said, oh, I come here like every day for 30 years and I really see it in a, in a different light now. So that being 
integrated into that community's life, a space that they know that they could see in a different way is really important. Mm. So there's been so many shows uh, and I'm really interested to know where does an idea come from? Where does a show start for you? It's always different, isn't it? Sometimes yeah, it, it starts from the site, like handled with care. I remember putting stuff into storage um, from another show. And I've never been to one of these self-storage buildings. They are fascinating. And I was chatting to the guy who's working there and said, who who um, comes here? Who uses this space? And he said to me, oh, you know, lots of people who move abroad and lots of couples. And when they break up, they put their stuff here and they never come back for it. <laughs> and I called Terry and I said, that's our show. That's our next show. And of course, the show wasn't about that. But the space was so full of story. But I think um, when we're thinking of stories or, or stories jump out to us so like when, before we made odds on we were going to make a show in a betting shop i'd just been in uh, in the bookies with my dad and i was looking around the space going god this room has so many rules that i don't understand and it has all these people from this community coming in here and uh, out every day and also gambling is a massive topic right now in the world and is affecting loads of people so it's like all these different elements it's like who are the people who occupy these spaces um, what are the different stories that live in them and what's the social aspect of it and then the human aspect. Yeah. So it's all like combining all these things usually make us feel like that's a good idea. And I remember when you, you told me about the betting shop idea, I felt great. I would never walk into one of these spaces. So mm. let's make a show about yeah. about those spaces. But it could also start from an article or from a picture mm something that could uh, or or from just working in cafes you know at the time before we made user not found we just worked a lot in cafes and looked at people around us behind their screens wondering what is their story so it sounds like sometimes well it can come from either of you but that moment of coming together and knowing you're onto a winner what's that like together i don't know if we ever know it's a winner do we? Mm, I don't think we know it's a winner, even after we made the show. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I think when we both get excited about I an idea, that's when we start mm. unpacking what it could be. I mean, that's the moment I love the most. It is lovely. I, I think I realized recently I'm, I'm a little bored when you come to re-rehearsing a show, remounting shows. I always sit there and I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, let's, let's remount this. I'm really interested in that process. I'm not actually. I love the play at the beginning when you don't know, when you walk in the dark and kind of look for what it could be and st try to feel what the shape of it might be. They often comes back to those very first impulses. Mm -hmm. I think something like Take On Me, I came in and I said, we should make a show in this leisure centre because I went to this leisure centre and it looks like a Wes Anderson film and there's kids in there swimming when they're babies and there's old people who've been told to go there by their doctors and they should have this kind of slightly odd feel and it, it should be all 80s music and all those things existed in the show that mm -hmm. happened two years later mm -hmm. um so a lot of them are like instinctual feelings yeah um, shout out to the music in your shows which is always bang on by the way <laughs> <laughs> but you also use the word play um mm. and i'm interested to hear some more about that how how does that pan out? Yeah, how do we play? Yeah, I think we organize play dates. After we have a bit of a, a bit of an idea together what it's going to be or what is the feel of the project, um, we invite people to play with us. And that could be literally sitting in the cafe or a leisure center t chatting to uh, ladies who just came out of an aqua aerobics group. I remember in Harlow when we played with Take a Me for the first yeah. time, we really didn't know what we were going to do. And there was me and you and Anna and Rachel Mars mm -hmm. and we you just set loads of tasks um so okay go into the changing room you're gonna have to do a two minute scene where you get entirely changed your clothes from what you had been wearing to and you also have to deliver a monologue into the mirror about what you're feeling inside or something like that it was that kind of an impulse and then that kind of ended up being in the show a version of that yeah it's very task based and it's very it's about me thinking okay let's put lots of limitations in a short time frame and see what comes out of it in that in that play period once we get into that play moment usually Daphne's directing and I'm performing along with other people um, and we kind of divide those responsibilities a bit uh, we we both create and actually we often ask our collaborators to come up with tasks as well mm -hmm. whether they're sound designers saying okay you're going to lead a sound task for us or 
um, Anna, who's got a dance background, can you lead something about uh, an aerobics class? And we definitely ask our collaborators to lead sessions as well because I guess we're lazy and we just don't want to no. lead everything. <laughs> 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 no, we want to be inspired by the other people we're working with. And usually we're bringing people in who are going to inspire us to do things that we wouldn't do just using our own brains. And you definitely feel the energy of that in the shows. But how, do, how, how, yeah. where does that come out? I think what I like about a Dante or Die show is a lot of site specific work is quite epic in scale. I sort mm. of, I'm thinking of like the knee high performances on beaches in Cornwall. I'm thinking of um, National Theatre of Wales, The Passion, you know, the amazing sort of Birmingham City Opera Company stuff that Graham Vick used to do. But actually, your shows are quite intimate. And yet, behind that intimacy, you feel a whole world. And that world must be the one that you've created, sort of peopled with the people you've collaborated with. Um, you, I think I know how much work goes in to a Dante or Die show when I see it, but actually when you're in it, there's a sort of distillation of that work that really comes through. Does that ring true for you, making it? Yeah, I think it does. And I think, I guess the way we make is filling our brains with research for that first play period isn't it mm -hmm. and that could be depending on what it's on like we've been researching a show for five years uh, about this this first same-sex marriage in a prison and we've spoken with prison officers and uh chapel chapel people who work in the chapel there we've talked to forensic psychologists we've talked to prisoners ex-prisoners lgbt uh support groups like we do so much research to get into the world of whatever that um that, that that group is or that space yeah, is. Yeah, I think we try to not just think about the show as the product. Mm. So when we created um, User Not Found, we did a whole piece of research with the death industry. <laughs> so we spoke to uh, solicitors who write wills and to um, after-death care for families and with people who deal with online legacies. And we've done symposiums around that. We've done Q&As around that. So there's always the bit that is not just the show itself. It's the engagement. It's the wider engagement that we could reach with the show. And I think all that stuff filters into the narrative or the writing or the design sometimes. And, if, and it's so hard to articulate how it comes out. Like sometimes people do say, and I, I watch people's shows and I'm like, so how did you get from the idea into this? And that's the joy of the creative process, isn't it? Mm. You know, we, we bring something to Yaniv, who's written music for loads of our shows and we show him some of the things and then he comes back with this sound that I would not have expected at all. And sometimes I, I kind of rail against it. I'm like, no, that's not what it was in my brain. And then he explains why for him, I remember it with You Are Not Found, like the moment where, I first received the text message that my partner's dead and there was a sound that he made um, that was like this ear splitting like ee sound and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't think that's what it should sound like and, and he was like, no, learned my dad's death and that is the sound that happened to me and I think that's going to sum it up and that's going to make the audience feel what your character's feeling with and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go with you, I'm going to believe you and let's go with it. Back to when I was six and went on a holiday in Wales and it rained and rained. I remember looking at the distance at these little sheep, like little watercolour blocks of amnesia. And I remember the pounding in my heart the first time I heard my mother say the word cloudburst. <laughs>
so when we were making, uh, we just made a film recently and it's our first time. We we're working with an animation director for the first time and an editor and uh, John, who was, who was working on Odds On with us as the animation director, he was self-taught and he was figuring it out and we were all experimenting with each other all the time. And it was really exciting just to say, John, we don't know how to do this in any way. Go for it. Try stuff out let's figure it out and I think and he's come back to us saying it was really fun to be able to kind of have free reign in a way but we love that with our collaborators to go we don't know what that is and actually the more we've worked in digital the more we've had to trust more people mm. haven't we yeah. so you're talking about odds on here which was the last work that of yours that I saw really powerful piece um uh interesting for a company that's about site specific work <laughs> in bricks and mortar buildings um, to be making a piece like that, you know, the conversation around digital theatre is quite live at the moment after the pandemic, and it can be quite divisive. Mm. Um, how have you approached working digitally? Yeah, I think I think I have a few answers for that question. <laughs> There's the the professional and the personal answers. Um, I think professionally, it wasn't to do with the pandemic that we started making work in the digital space. It was before that. I think when you make work in real life working spaces, it was inevitable that we look around and see most people's real working spaces are screens. They're laptops and phones and headphones. And we wanted to look at that and research those spaces as the places that we visit every day. And what do they mean to us? Um, So we started that with the user not found live show and then ex- extending that conversation when we made it into a completely digital piece of work. Um, and the personal reason, I think, is that um, we just wanted to make some work that didn't involve touring, partly because of where we were at in our lives. We were a little bit older than we were when we started. It's a bit harder to go around everywhere in a van. It's also not very sustainable. And wanted to be able to reach people who may not be able to get to those spaces to see a Dante or Dai show. And to clarify, I wanted to clarify, I don't don't want to answer for you, Terry, but I wanted to clarify for myself what are our skills. Because for years I felt I have no hard skills. Everybody else, I look around, people know how to edit softwares or they know how to build something. And and we don't do anything that requires actual skills, right? (laughs) And something happened when I remember calling Terry and saying, I want to make a documentary that was way before we made a documentary. But that something about creating work in different aspects of the digital space just clarified to me that what we're what we can do, what we know how to do is have an idea, play around it and make it into a thing. And it could be a podcast. It could be. A, di- a documentary it could be an interactive film it could be a show in a real life space but it's all the same process and does that make sense it does it sounds really affirming it was affirming and yeah. sort of that it opened up new possibilities on the one hand but also just returned you to the core of what you do i think it returns to the core of what we do because somehow there's still a dante or die vibe to odds on even though it's a film it's got something to do with the the things we're interested in in terms of an audience being a part of the world. And the site is the the gambling website that you're kind of within. Well, yeah, I mean, is it Felicity, the character? I mean, mm-hmm. she's fully immersed in that world, to, you know, for good and ill, isn't she? Um, and so it was a strange experience being a Dante or Die audience member who's usually the one immersed, mm. watching her be immersed uh, a- a- and watching and willing her to get herself out of it mm. as well. You know, there's just a lot of change in the moment, that's all. I just feel a little lost. Like I don't know who I am anymore. And I just want it all to be quiet. And then when it is quiet, I just grave noise. You know, when I was working all day at the clinic, my people just needed me every day. I think I had a sort of compassion fatigue. I'm 
so sorry. But I wasn't fully there for you and the kids. And now I can finally take care of you. And it's interesting because we're going to... Well, we've been experimenting with how to get it out to audiences as well. So it's, it's kind of doing a live... Uh, not a live, a digital tour with theatres all around the country, which is interesting experiment. But we're also going to Wales Millennium Centre to their box and they're kind of doing an installation version where you sit on a beanbag and you've got an iPad and headphones and you can do it in a space that's been designed for that. So it's kind of interesting. We were doing some interactive screenings as well where one person is the audience member doing the interactive bits. So we're, we're playing with it a little bit. It's interesting. But even when we made the um, documentary about Skin Hunger, if we're talking about the digital space, so we knew Skin Hunger was a show that only Mm. 18 people a day could experience, which is nothing, and a lot of work got into that. So we knew we wanted a digital output that could reach more people. But we still thought about how can we make it a Dante or Die thing. We wanted to put the audience at the heart of the experience. Mm. So the story of the film is the story of three audience members experiencing it. It's not the story of the show, if that makes sense. I think seeing Skin Hunger at that moment, I was aware of just how lucky, privileged I was to be one of so few audience members to experience that show. Um, And it... I'm not going to lie, added to the magic of it somehow. I think there's part of being an audience member for this kind of thing where you feel special. You, you're you made to feel special. But clearly you wanted to have more people experience that. Why? I think there is something about such small shows and about our work and about theatre in general. <laughs> it happens for a second and then it disappears. And I always ask, did it actually happen? So there's something about publishing a book or making a film that I, it's it's lying to ourselves saying it stays here for longer <laughs> there's something about um sharing that moment just for a little bit longer just with a few more people that um maybe it's something we just do for ourselves it's our egos <laughs> it's our egos <laughs> and i think the digital space also gives us an opportunity to extend the access it's something that's been really at the heart of what we do you know our shows either have integrated captions or a bsl interpreter Uh, we would never hardly ever do a show somewhere that isn't accessible we would always have an accessible route for a wheelchair but that was opening it even more for people who couldn't get to a space to watch a show it it just felt like economically um, and physically it could allow us to bring the show our shows or our work to people who couldn't physically attend the shows I think as as makers and as collaborators it was also something new for us to do work with a filmmaker how do we document this in an interesting way how do we learn through to make to make a documentary and that was great for us and we've said I'd want to make another documentary Mm. Um, so I guess usually with every project we do we're also challenging ourselves a bit this podcast is challenging us as well this is really different we don't usually do this we're not super out there on the socials or chatting about what we do. So we're, we're learning new things. So you have all these conversations, you collaborate with all these experts and theatre makers and the audiences, but there must be moments when it just comes back to you two. And I just kind of am fascinated still to learn a little bit more about that process and, and how it's changed over the years. You've talked about trust in relation to other people. There must be quite a lot of trust between you two now too. I think there is a huge amount of trust. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's feel, actually what makes it work. Yeah, I always feel like if I'm not there, but Terry's there, it's the same thing. I don't have to physically be somewhere if Terry's there. We yeah. will probably give the same answer. When we go to a restaurant <laughs> and we look at the menu, we would always want two things and look at each other and just go, so should we share these two dishes? Because we know what the other one would want anyway. This is yeah. the kind of relationship we've got. It's very boring to say that. Our podcast, <laughs> no our, our podcast producer's are going, this is not good listening. She's no. looking at not us good going, audio. No. Uh, but <laughs> give us were, some dirt there were moments of like I remember we tried to make a show on a ski lift mm. a long time ago 
Oh my goodness. I really, really wanted to make that show. We didn't know what it was about, but we did a two week R and D <laughs> in Edinburgh on a ski lift. We had aerialists dangling off it. We had a cellist playing the cello. It was it was it was a crazy project. We worked on it for two years. We tried to fundraise for it and make it happen. We had a ski lift and a snow sports center given to us for free. Yeah. We had a theater partner. We just didn't have the money to make it. I mean, and also we were like, we just started out. We'd only been a couple of years as a company. We didn't have jobs. We weren't getting paid to do any of the work we were no, doing to try a, to produce it. A really ambitious project in a different city that we tried to produce. And we just, after two years, we despaired and, and we almost shut down the company. I remember so I think sitting... We wrote like 24 funding applications or something. We didn't get anything. Which now sounds like nothing compared <laughs> to how many funding applications we write per project. But I remember sitting on your bed mm-hmm. um, in London Bridge where we both used to live back then and we thought, okay, so this is the end of the road. This is... We're not going to continue because we haven't managed to to do this. And then I remember Neil... My husband. Your your now husband. He wasn't husband at the time. Um, said, "Oh, but guys, you're so good together. You shouldn't give up." And he really he gave us like a pep talk of <laughs> how can we like continue working together. And we did a really special thing which we still refer to. And we said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna let go of this one." Which every time we go and lead a workshop, I always do lots of exercises about letting go of ideas because Hmm. I think that is the most important lesson to learn. Ideas come easily. Making them come to life is the hard part, right? Um, And I remember we were so lost because we were so invested in making that show. We invited lots and lots of people to come and play with us. Oh, relating to what you asked earlier about the process. And I think a lot of it came from there. So we took a couple of weeks. We hired a studio and every day we had a different person coming to lead a workshop with the two of us. And there were other directors, there were academics, there were dancers, there were set designers. And we said it could be about anything, just share something with us. And, and lead us. And lead us. And be responsible for that. And we also said, let's just put in the diary, going together to see art yeah. and experience things. So yeah. it sounds like, it, again, it's like knowing when you're enough, the two of you, to push through for the next stage and knowing when you absolutely need to go out and talk and meet mm-hmm. other people. And I guess the other thing for me, I guess, uh, as a performer, as well as the co director of an organisation, is that Daphne challenges me all the time. And we're not afraid of that, or I'm not. I think I used to be afraid of that when I was younger. Um, and Daphne will push me so hard as, <laughs> as a performer to do things I didn't think I could do. And I find that so inspiring and, and it's ex- so exciting to make a new thing with with her as a, as a collaborator because I know I'll be like, I'm going to do something I don't know how, how I'm going to do it. And, and she'll push me and push me and push me. There's a bit in News Are Not Found where I had to scream. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it for so long. And she just kept pushing, push, 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 push. Needling. And that was one of the best bits of the show. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think at- it, it's together we try to put ourselves in situations where we don't know how that's all going to work. These, This is when it works the best, when you don't know the answers. In fact, I'm, I think we're both a little bored in the moments that <laughs> we know the answers because we've done that before. So that's not no longer interesting for us. And to sit with a little discomfort sometimes. Mm-hmm. A lot it's of really discomfort. important. It's, it's very precarious. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the other things that I really like about a Dante or Die show, if I'm being really honest, is that I always feel a little bit nervous before I come to one. Um, I don't know quite what's going to happen or what's going to be asked of me a bit like this podcast, actually, although I'm meant to be asking the questions of you. Um, and so I wondered if you feel nervous too, going into them always. Is that part of the magic? I think the start is we don't know. I think it's excitement. We're just like, yeah, anything yeah. can happen. The best kind of encounters when anything could happen. Then it's really nerve wracking when we start it and we're actually doing it for people and I'm taking my clothes off and I'm like, why did I choose to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hugging a, a performer in a church in the middle of London. What's that about? Yeah. Covered in plastic. All these like intimate, strange encounters that stick in our minds afterwards. Um, yeah, that's quite... Uh, thrilling. Thrilling and human. 
Well, it's been amazing speaking to you today. I think I always want to keep part of the mystery of your shows, exactly <laughs> that, a mystery. But I think it's confirmed to me what I already know, which is just how much sort of exploration and play goes on behind the scenes to get to the thing that I see along with the rest of the audience. Um, and how much goodwill as well. I mean, you know, we want a bit of frisson and a bit of trouble and you've been really honest about the challenges, but you just seem to love what you do still after all this time. Somehow. We do. We love, we love what we do and we always keep learning new things, which is part of the joy of it. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Nancy. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to listen to the rest of the podcast series and um, come to your next show, whatever that may be. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dante or Die podcast. Now, if you want to know any more about our work, head to danteordie.com. It's all there. And if you have any questions for us, comments or thoughts, uh, we'd love to hear from you. At Dante or Die. Hashtag DOD podcast. Thank you to our producers, Marie Horner and Erica McCoy. And to Yannine Friedel for his brilliant music. Huge thank you to our Dante team, Lucy, Sophie, Caitlin, Catherine. You've been amazing. The podcast was recorded at Phoenix Court and Soho Sonic Studios. And it's been funded by Arts Council England. So thank you.